you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And yeah, we would really like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to participate at this really important and timely session. Uh, our presentation uh, has two main parts. I will first introduce very briefly the history, aims, and activities of the EAA. And then my colleague Sophie Hücklin will uh, present some thoughts about uh, the new pathways that the EAA is taking and also possible uh, collaborations with CIFA and other organizations. But before we uh, start with that part, I would like to introduce a very brief personal note as our EAA president li uh, did last Wednesday in his keynote lecture, Felipe Criado. As has been mentioned, uh, both Sophie and me are non-UK uh, citizens. I am um, half Spanish, half German, as you can probably guess from my surname. But I have now been working for nearly four years in the UK, and I have made this country my home. And Sophie is a German archaeologist who has lived and worked for a very long time in Switzerland. And also during the last two years, she has been a Marie Curie fellow here at Newcastle University. And I think it's, it's really important that to always remember that the mobility of students and staff members has been uh, one of the really defining characteristics of universities since the very foundation in the Middle Ages, and that we need to make sure that this continues to be the case in the future. Uh, despite any political changes and challenges that arise. So most of you will be familiar with uh, uh, the information we are going to present on the EAA. Uh, I do the boring part, the uh, presentation, and then Sophie will do the more, more exciting section with uh, thoughts for the future. Where are we heading to? So the EAA, the European Association of Archaeologists, is a membership-based, not-for-profit association. It is open to archaeologists, uh, but also other related or interested individuals or bodies in Europe and beyond. And I would like to emphasize uh, this last part, also this aspect, and beyond, because many of our members, as we will see, are not from, the, uh, are not from Europe. The EAA was founded in 1994. There was an inaugurational meeting in Ljubljana in Slovenia, and then the first real conference took place in Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain. In terms of government, it has an executive board elected by the members of the association, and we have elections every year for uh, board members uh, that stay for a period of three years, and then they can be re-elected uh, potentially. They have to go for another election. The same applies to the president. Uh, in terms of presidents, uh, the current one is Felipe Criado, who had a keynote on Wednesday. And the others were Christian Christiansen, William Williams, Anthony Harding, and Friedrich Lut. And it seems quite obvious from this list that uh, I think we need a woman as a president at some point very, very soon in the future. Aims and objective. Well, uh, first of all, obviously, to promote the development of archaeological research and exchange of archaeological information promote the management and interpretation of European archaeological heritage, proper ethical and scientific standards for archaeological work, and this is an aspect that also links with some of the sessions that have already uh, taken place here at the, at the CIFA conference, promote the interest of professional archaeologists in Europe, and finally, last but not least, to promote the cooperation with other organizations with similar aims, for example, the Society for American Archaeology, the World Archaeology Congress, the UISPP, the Union Internationale de Sciences Prehistoriques et Protehistoriques, and other organizations uh, in Asia, in Africa, and South America. And this, is, uh, this last aspect is something that we also really want to, to enhance, to develop uh, for the near future. The main activity of the EAA, as you probably know, are the annual conferences. Uh, they take place once a year uh, at the end of August, beginning of September, usually in the first uh, first week of September, always in a different country. Uh, you will see a, a map with the conference locations in a minute. Uh, the conferences are really the, <coughs> the common arena that makes EAA being alive, but it's not the only activity and should on, also not be the only aim of the association. And we are trying to go beyond the conference, enhance membership, uh, and participation in the EAA beyond 
conference attendance. We published the European Journal of Archaeology. Uh, actually, at the beginning, at the very beginning, when the EIA was started, the main aim, I would say, was having a common journal for European archaeology. That was the very foundation of the EIA, having the journal and having the annual conference. But then it, the association has expanded enormously, and we have different publication series, but also many other kinds of different activities that we are promoting. In terms of publications, uh, we started two years ago uh, at the conference in Glasgow, the monograph series Seems in Contemporary Archaeology, which is uh, basically devoted to edited volumes arising from EAA sessions. And we also have an electronic newsletter, the European Archaeologist. And probably also uh, very soon we will expand this uh, publication series with some uh, very nice new additions. Uh, we do give certain prizes and awards, uh, for example, the European Archaeological Heritage Prize to prominent uh, individuals, the EA Student Award. We really want students to participate at our conferences, attend, but also present, and there are different mechanisms to promote their uh, engagement. And we have the honorary membership in the EA. Uh, we would also like to start very soon a uh, different uh, book awards following in a way the model of the SAA in, in North America. A very important aspect of the EAA uh, is that we have, within the, this large organization, we have different uh, groups of interest, different bodies of archaeologists focusing around uh, a topic or a task. We have several task forces that have uh, short, terms, short term aims but very concrete goals that have to be achieved. We have committees, uh, for example, Committee on the Illicit Trade in Cultural Material, Committee on the Teaching and Training of Archaeologists, uh, this, uh, this last one uh, led by uh, Raymond Kahn, who is here in the audience, uh, and many others. And more recently, we have also introduced the, uh, introduced the concept of communities, communities of interest, people that uh, want to create networks around a certain topic. Uh, as I said, the, the main activity of the EAA are the annual conferences. This is a map showing the different locations of the conference since the very beginning of the organization, the first meeting in Ljubljana, then the meeting in Santiago, and then in the last uh, 20, 20, 23 years now, conferences in most of Europe, there's still some gaps that we hope to fill in the, in the near future, and obviously we are also revisiting countries. Uh, this year, the annual conference will be in Maastricht, next, uh, next year in Barcelona, then we have Bern, and 2020 Budapest. The EAA uh, is uh, officially based as an association with headquarters in Prague, in the Czech Republic, uh, but obviously it's a transnational pan-European association. It's really... Uh, uh, encouraging to see the development of a uh, membership in the EAA since its very foundation, starting with a few hundred members, then going to a period in the late 90s and early 2000s with a membership number of around 1,000, and then really expanding in the last uh, in the last years. Uh, we see here this rise since 2011, going up to more than 2,000 members. Last year we had. A few less members, but this was mostly due because uh, membership is still very much linked to attendance to the conference, and the conference dates coincided with the World Archaeological Conference in Kyoto in Japan, so many of our members decided to go to Japan, and we cannot blame them for that. <laughs> uh, but in general terms, I think we have a consolidated membership of uh, at least 2,000 people every year. Uh, and this, this uh, table here shows the number of total members of the EAA and conference delegates. And we see that although there are obviously more members than uh, conference delegates, there's still a very close correlation. Looking to the future, we really want to, to uh, over, overcome, at least partly, uh, this, this phenomenon so that people that might not be able to attend the conference in a particular year, they're still EAA members because they see the benefits of the Association for Archaeology in Europe for promoting the interests of archaeology, heritage, 
uh, but also because they can participate in different communities, different committees, and benefit from the different services offered by the association. Uh, and this is a breakdown of our membership, uh, membership numbers by countries. And as you can see here, uh, most of our members are uh, based in the UK. It's important to know that mem uh, membership by countries here is defined by your place of work, not by your nationality. So for example, I am German and Spanish, but I count as British because I work here, and Sophie counts as Swiss, and so on. Uh, but very clearly, most of our members are UK, and it has always been the case. And we, we really hope and we think it will still continue to be this, uh, the case in the future. Uh, EAA is much more than just the EU. Obviously, most of our members uh, are based in EU countries, but we also have members from, 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 from other places around the world. Actually, quite a lot of our members come from the US, uh, usually around 100 people. Uh, people working in, in North America, but with an interest in, in European archaeology that regularly come to the conferences and are quite engaged even uh, uh, on the level of bodies such as the nomination committee where we have Bettina Arnold, for example, from Milwaukee. We have also quite a, quite a lot of members from countries like Russia, uh, and then countries also in, in, other, in, other, in, other parts, in other parts of the world, including cases such as Japan, Azerbaijan, and I recognize here our Nepalese member uh, in the room. Uh, and for, well, I just heard that he's back in the UK, so I think we lost that country for the association. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, what we want to emphasize is that EAA is more than EU. And uh, in the context of Brexit, I think that's an important point also looking to the future. So at this point, I will... Uh, uh, introduce my colleague Sophie Hüglein, who will present the second part of this paper, and she will speak about the structure and our future of the EA and possible collaborations. Thank you. I start with this picture. Um, this is a kind of a bit unconventional uh, way how to depict the uh, EAA and or to uh, uh, depict the structures of usually you have squares. Uh, now I try to uh, get a bit more into the dyna dynamic character of the EAA and, and probably it's uh, so dynamic that it's going to change uh, soon again because Felipe actually said, oh Sophie, maybe you shouldn't show it because we, we want to change the number of more members. So uh, this here would be uh, Felipe and you see it's just uh, this, these, the yellow ones are the members and so from the members there come the, the uh, executive board members and uh, there are different functions uh, so that the officers are, have a bit more responsibility and they meet a bit more often that the, than the executive board but there are a lot more bodies uh, in the EAA for example this is uh, our journal and has its own ed editorial board or there are statutory uh, committees uh, like the nomination committee uh, uh, sitting here uh, but most of our jobs are voluntary so we have no, uh, apart from here the secretariat there is uh, hardly any employed staff so the uh, the, um, um, the journal board gets some uh, remuneration but uh, that's not a salary uh, anything so that is still uh, the basis we are very much based on voluntary uh, work um, what are our aims now? What are, how would we like to change in the, in the coming years? That is what we, what we have set up for the years uh, 2017 to 21. So we want to, we are on the way to become the primary uh, European forum for the exchange of information and research knowledge uh, in, in the uh, area of archaeology and archaeological heritage. This is the field we actually want to uh, um, take uh, our place in and uh, want to occupy. Um, we also want to be uh, the leading representative body uh, and agency for the protection and management of uh, European archaeological heritage and cultural life and society. This is a, a big task and uh, we will have to live up to that uh, um, if we want to achieve that. Um, 
the, uh, Manuel has already mentioned the standards of ethic, uh, scientific and ex uh, ex excellence and communication and professional engagement. But EAA sets these standards up, but we don't really test them. So that is a bit, uh, maybe a, a weak point. That is something that EAA can, can uphold the standards, but does not really check anybody uh, whether they adhere to these standards. We could, of course, exclude members if they don't, uh, but uh, as far as I know, that hasn't happened so far. Um, we also we, um, want to be of social rev uh, relevance uh, when it comes to archaeology and archaeologists in society and for humanity as a whole. Um, there is also the, the aim of cooperation with other organizations, and that's what, uh, what we are uh, here for. Uh, to enhance that. And, um, but all is also about um, to, to enable members uh, to get engaged and ha to have influence uh, on politics and archaeology um, um, in, their, in their fields. How, how are we going to go about to uh, achieve these aims? What we have done already is um, uh, that we have uh, um, enlarged our secretariat. Uh, there are more people now working. And that has also to do uh, that we are going to take over the conference management. So Barcelona will be the first conference where, uh, where we have to the, the take over the conference registration and the abstract handling. And that will very much uh, be the chance for EAA um, to be more visible uh, to the uh, to uh, their, their members. Now, always we had kind of the, the conference organizers and there was EAA and people were not quite sure uh, what was what and why they had to pay to two to different bodies. Uh, this will um, kind of be overcome with uh, Barcelona. We also want to develop our conference uh, format and content and uh, the new thing in Maastricht will be that we have uh, keynote speakers. We invited keynote speakers. Um, we also aim to have rather shorter contributions and then we, that we enhance discussion. Uh, and session filming is also becoming more and more normal. normal. Uh, the, the problem with the shorter contributions is very much that people come say, oh, I don't travel so many hours and then just have 10 minutes to, to address an audience. Uh, but if we want to succeed with our format, we have to uh, to, to get that shorter, especially if we want to peop uh, people to talk to each other and not once one person here and the other just listening. Uh, we have more interaction, we have to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, and it's also, of course, uh, 10 minutes is a much, much better format uh, to put on YouTube uh, than if you speak uh, for 20 minutes or half an hour. Um, yeah. And we also want to transform the way uh, our working groups are set up. They are not so much structured at the moment, but uh, Manuel was already going into that, that, it, that uh, there is, will be a, a much clearer structures of EAA communities, task forces, committees, and commissioners. These will be the four categories we want to create and uh, put into the handbook. So what is the, the cooperation with CIFA? How, how do we think about, uh, how does uh, EAA think about that? So CIFA is a, is a um, very important partner organization uh, for EAA. And uh, we estimated, we have no numbers for that yet, that maybe two, three hundred uh, are members of EAA and CIFA uh, together. Um, that, could, that could increase, I think. That, uh, that would uh, certainly be something we would like to increase. Um, but EAA uh, profits a lot is uh, the specific competencies uh, that uh, CIFA has, uh, and that is also what we want to what we want to introduce into EAA. We want to be professionalize our organisation. That means uh, uh, employing staff and. Uh, um, we are producing statements and lobbying with politicians. That is a part where, a, where we are not uh, as strong as we should be, but that also depends very much on the number of members we have and the income, uh, the, the stability of income we can uh, in, uh, generate. 
Uh, together with uh, CIFA, we would like to develop a vision and strategies for the future of archaeology uh, in Britain and Europe, but also beyond. And um, EIA and CIFA together can bring uh, archaeology into the public deba debate. So I made a... I tried to ca characterize CIFA and EAA um, and made, made a, maybe a bit of a caricature uh, of the two organizations uh, to, to enhance what, what are their differences. Uh, uh, and um, if you look at that, um, <coughs> CIFA very much uh, seems to be um, the, the more stable, the territorial, uh, organization that is very cl clear where it is, while EAA is a bit more of a floating body. It's a, a temporary, uh, um, it's, a, it's more an event. You see also here the academics uh, certainly play a, a greater role, while here we have the tradition of the field archaeologists. Um, and so we, you can, we can kind of uh, contrast the, the two organizations and say, yeah, okay, they, they actually, the interests are against each other, but at the, on the other hand, we can say they are very nicely complementary and they could work together. Uh, and what I actually also want to say is if we, if we, inha if we do too much of that, what we are already, we, we won't create more overlap. So we, both of us be, must become more like the other uh, and staying complementary at the same time. So how could our future look like? I, I looked at this, um, this is, I took this from Jerry's um, paper, oh, 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 not. <laughs> Jerry's paper, the, the growth of CIFA membership. So CIFA is, is 10 years older, so they have a considerable a larger membership, about a, a thousand more than EAA. So uh, I should have made uh, EAA a bit smaller, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and uh, how, how, so that is the, um, what, what happens with, with, if, if we take all the impacts of Brexit, uh, then actually we could shrink apart. This is kind of a CIFA that is only concentrating on uh, chartered uh, British arch uh, field archaeologists and, uh, and, and building this wall here. And I think actually this would lead to more or less losing of members because also I'm, I'm thinking of in a 10 years time or in 20 years time because then the baby boomers will be over and also archaeology will won't be the same profession anymore. And uh, here EAA might still grow, might not, we, we don't know, but the overlap uh, will Maybe be there, but it, I think it certainly will will get less uh, if we kind of go apart in in the directions. What I really would like us to do is um, actually try and continue this growth, and uh, see if I'm having a way how to overcome this uh, only this um, uh, classifying and uh, but also having an open hand, having stretching out, uh, finding a way to include uh, international. Uh, members that uh, be uh, also attractive to academics and uh, also then we would increase the overlap so at the moment the two three hundred would be here so but we have a, a potential to do much more much more of that and I uh, come uh, and conclude with a concrete proposals uh, that have been kind of a bit discussed between Philippe and Pete or uh, me speaking to Gary um, uh, but uh, they are not agreed, but uh, these are ide ideas how we could uh, work better together. So uh, the way how CIFA usually uh, <coughs> um, goes about with other organizations is uh, to set up a mem memorandum of understanding. Um, uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, uh, that EAA or the offer that EAA can make is uh, to, uh, CIFA to become an affiliate member. Um, and also EAA and CIFA could uh, produ produce statements together, political statements. Um, uh, we, at, the, at the conferences, it would be a, poss a possibility to, to offer each other uh, con um, discounted booths. Uh, what is more difficult is uh, how, how we can encourage uh, dual or multiple memberships. And uh, we saw that there is maybe a possibility to give, give a mutual discount on conference fees. 
Um, yeah, and one of the biggest problems is how do we get a, uh, across to the continent and how do we set something like CIFA up in Europe that is attractive to European archaeologists. Thank you very much.